Someone is praying for you. Someone is praying for you. So when it seems you're all alone and your heart would break in two, remember someone is praying for you. Have the clouds round you gathered in the midst of a storm? Is your ship tossed and battered? Are you weary and worn? Don't lose hope, someone's praying for you this very day. And peace be still is already on the way. Someone is praying for you. Someone is praying for you. So when seems you're all alone and your heart would break in two. Remember someone is praying for you. When it seems that you pray till your strength is all gone, and your tears fall like raindrops all the day long. Jesus cares, and he knows just how much you can bear. He'll speak your name to someone in prayer. Someone is praying for you. Someone is praying for you. So when it seems you're all alone and your heart would break in two, Remember someone is praying for you. So when it seems you're all alone and your heart would break in two, remember someone is praying for you. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5, and I'm in a very uh, intriguing series on the Beatitudes. And that's the attitude you ought to have towards problems, towards sin, towards the Savior, um, towards life in general. And the word, that the key word in every verse is blessed. That means to have peace and joy. And I don't know how people make it without the Lord. Do you? I mean, I just don't know how they make it uh, through some of the things y'all been through in this very room. The loss of a son. Um, loss of a, a father and mother, um, tragedies, things happening that um, there's no way on this earth that anyone can handle that uh, properly without the Lord. And so I want to preach uh, the second beatitude tonight. But I want to read on down through uh, 
uh, verse uh, 12 because it kind of sets the framework of what I believe this uh, beatitude of mourning is all about. So let's stay in all the Word of God for just a few minutes and uh, we won't keep you at 8.30. It'll be about 8.15 or so and you'll have plenty of time to get the kids uh, to bed tonight because they probably need more sleep. But it says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountain and when he was set, when he was said, his disciples came unto him. So he's sitting down teaching the Word of God, the greatest probably sermon on the mount that's ever recorded. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Um, that's what we preached on Wednesday a week ago. Last week, Brother Jeremy had questions and answers. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And here's the night's text. It says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are, the, are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye when... Men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all matter of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven and so, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You may be seated as I pray. Father, thank you for the wonderful song on prayer. God, we do need prayer tonight as well as many people need prayer, God, that are making um, tremendous decisions about their ministry. God, we pray for the preachers that's going to preach in the morning, Brother Chris and Brother Kyle, Lord, that you just anoint them to encourage so many preachers, Lord, that just feel like giving up. And Lord, I just pray to your God that you'd bless each one that's cooked something for this meal. Uh, Lord, thank you for their labor of love uh, to preach for these, uh, cook for these men of God and ladies of God that's going to gather tomorrow. But Lord, we pray tonight that you'd bless, that you'd help us as we preach, uh, God, and help us to see how wonderful it is to have the Comforter in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, I want to review with just one uh, slide uh, of last week, and that is uh, the first beatitude, which is blessed are the poor in spirit. That don't mean you have a poor spirit. I've met a lot of people, or some people, that just have poor spirits. They're just negative and uh, down and out and sad and blue and critical and cynical. Uh, but poor in spirit means you must be empty before you can be full. Uh, the, and, and the opposite of this is self-sufficiency. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. This is just in, in uh, review since I didn't preach last Wednesday night. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Now, folks, you can't handle things in life. Um, there is no way on this earth that you can get comfort in some situations without the Lord. Uh, you can't get wisdom on how to handle things. And um, it's just wonderful to have Jesus as your personal Savior, not some religious person in your life, but your personal Savior that abides in you to give you sufficiency over the things you can't handle. In other words, you really can't handle life. You can't handle the devil. You can't handle sin. And I want to tell you something, folks, you can't handle the flesh. Only God can. And we're in the last days. I believe that with all my heart. And I believe it's getting worse but uh, the world promotes self-sufficiency. Yet God dwells with man whose heart is broken. Uh, Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15 says this, For thus saith the high and lofty one, that's God, that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I will dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. See, the Bible says 
you've got to be humble, poor in spirit. You need to be humble for God to abide with you. And so, in other words, you've got to die to self and die to self-sufficiency and realize you need God. And uh, religious folks don't believe they need God. Um, people that are trying to live without God are just really shaking their fists at their creator and saying, God, I can manage it without you. And that is a total lie from the pit of hell. You cannot manage this life without God. And tonight I want to preach just a few minutes on the second beatitude, and that is the, the mourning. Um, you know, the Bible says, blessed are they that mourn. Uh, and that seems like a, a terrible subject, but it's really a great subject because that's the avenue to comfort. Amen? And, uh, you know, some people mourn over their sports team. Some people mourn over a uh, loss of finances, and they really mourn. And some people mourn unnaturally. Uh, uh, you know, they have a, a mourning uh, because they lost someone, and they can't get over it. And I've, I've been there, and you've been there. But I want to tell you how you can get over it, and how you not get, get over it, but you can let God handle your broken heart. And we all have broken hearts. Look at Matthew chapter 5 again, and uh, we'll get right to the point. It says, Blessed are, are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Uh, there are several kinds of sorrow. Number one, there's the natural sorrow. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, that we should sorrow not as those that have no hope. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and His righteousness, and our hope is he's coming soon. Amen. I believe that with all my heart. And I believe you do too. Um, but folks, this kind of sorrow comes to everybody. There's trouble in this world. The Bible says in um, Job that this world is full of trouble. Uh, man is born of woman and full of trouble. Uh, John 16, says, In this world you shall have tribulation. How many has ever had anything happen in your life that you could not handle? Raise your hand. Maybe you're having some things in your life right now you can't handle. And that's a great admission. And so what you need to do is mourn. And you say, well, how long? Well, I'll tell you in just a minute. Uh, how can we mourn? Well, uh, natural sorrow is not sinful. Uh, it is a gift of God. Mourning is an expression of love. And there is, a, there is hopeless sorrow uh, that is in the lost heart. Because I want to tell you something, people without Jesus have no hope. People without Jesus have no comfort. And that's why I'm so glad I'm saved, not only to miss hell, but to go to, and to go to heaven one day. What a wonderful blessing that is. But also to have heavenly comfort on this earth. And I'll tell you how to get that comfort in just a moment. But um, mourning is an expression of love. Just as tears are, are a gift from God, it's all right to cry. Um, I was at my daddy's funeral, and, and the preacher was rebuking everybody that was crying. My mother was crying. I was crying. We were all crying. And my daddy only got saved six years. And uh, we were so excited about him um, living for God and, and um, being a new person in Christ. No longer did he burn the house up, wreck the cars. Uh, no longer did he fall and hurt himself and lose the uh, paycheck on the way home and uh, couldn't, couldn't eat. No longer do we have to go through that junk because when he got saved, he got saved. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things pass away, old all things come new. But all those years of drinking, uh, he come down with cirrhosis of the liver and pancreatic cancer. And at that funeral, the preacher rebuked us for crying. And I thought, that don't sound right. That don't even feel right. Folks, tears or a language that God understands. And it's all right to cry. Now, I don't think you ought to cry uh, for years and years and years over your loved ones. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not saying I got over it, never will. When you lose a daddy or mom, uh, you always miss them. But I want to tell you this, friend, there is a comfort. And that's a supernatural comfort. And I want you to notice that there's an unnatural sorrow. Godly sorrow heals. Unnatural sorrow makes the wounds deeper. That's called depression. You ever been there, done that? Anybody ever been depressed? 
I mean, really depressed where you couldn't uh, get out of bed or you didn't want to get out of bed. Uh, and then you didn't realize, you, you thought to yourself, there ain't no reason to get out of bed. And you was depressed. Um, depression kills people. Depression deceives people. Uh, depression's real. And folks, unnatural sorrow makes the wound deeper and fills the heart with pain. Left off a T on that word. It, f- it fills the heart with pain. Uh, natural sorrow helps us put life back together. So unnatural sorrow tears uh, uh, things, uh, tears things apart. Uh, but uh, real, real sorrow from God keeps it um, together and puts life back together like it was. Maybe not like it was, but even better, because God transforms our sorrow into joy. Our sorrow into hope, our sorrow into peace, and that and and you can't get that on your own. Say Amen. You ever tried psychologists, uh, books, uh, trying to escape liquor, drugs, sex? None of that will give you comfort. And a lot of people think money can buy comfort. No, it can't. And so, what's the causes for unnatural s- sorrow? That's the question of the hour. Well, number one, uh, selfishness sometimes. Sometimes can cause unnatural sorrow. That means mourning and never getting over it. You know, just not even be able to function. Um, the tears are not for the, the loved one. The tears are for, for themselves. And they uh, feel like uh, they're mad at God. They get bitter at God for taking their loved one. Um, and then also this mourning and this sorrow is not only about losing somebody that's close to you, it's about dealing with sin. And sometimes people have unnatural sorrow because of fear. Uh, they fear they can't make it without that person or they can't make it. Uh, then there's guilt. Guilt. Uh, Absalom uh, had a lot of guilt. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 33 um, David had a lot of guilt about Absalom. He said, my son, my son, would to God that I died for thee. And that wasn't a good prayer because he needed to be alive because he was chosen to be king of Israel and, and uh, he was, he was uh, guilty of adultery. He was guilty of murder and he felt like that that was a fourfold payment uh, for, his, um, for his sin. And Nathan, the prophet, said, you're going to pay fourfold. And he did. The illegitimate child died. Um, Absalom uh, died in the war of rebellion against his daddy. Um, Amnon uh, raped his half-sister Tamar. And on and on and on it went. And then uh, Absalom killed Amnon. And that's the fourth child that died. And it's all because of sin. And so he was guilty, but he let that guilt almost cause him to just give up and quit and step down from the kingdom. Listen, we need to realize, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. There's hope. There's hope. Um, Psalms 51 uh, tells us how to get comfort over our sin and how to get comfort and courage to go on for God. Look at Psalms 51, verse 16 and 17, please. Psalms, Proverbs, uh, you, you can find it. Psalms 51, and I want you to look at verse 17 and 18. We'll go back to Psalms 51 in a minute to show you about real confession, real confession of sin. In Psalms 51, the Bible says in verse 16, it says, um, For thou desirest not sacrifice, he don't want you to get religious when you have sorrow. Um, he don't want you to do five penance and five Hail Marys. and He don't want you to go through the motion Baptist and just you know go to church as, as a motion. He wants you to worship Him with a broken and contrite heart. O God, Thou will not despise. And so, folks, He delighteth not in burnt offerings. He delighteth not in surface confession. And so we see selfishness and fear and guilt uh, can cause uh, unnatural uh, sorrow. 
uh, sorrow that never goes away, uh, depression that affects your health, affects you mentally where you want to die and commit murder to yourself, which is suicide, which is never right and never God's will. You're becoming God when you do that kind of thing. Um, and there's no comfort for the loved ones. And so we see there's supernatural sorrow. There's supernatural comfort after supernatural sorrow. So why would a beatitude be blessed are they that mourn? Because it's the right kind of mourning. Um, in context, this was over the sin of the whole world, the sin of that nation, the persecution they were going through. And he said, hey, listen, I know you're mourning over your loved ones that's been killed for God's sake, but don't give up and get some comfort. Wouldn't it be terrible if your daddy or mother were killed for being a Christian? I mean, it's bad enough to lose a soldier that's uh, defending the faith and uh, the freedom. But somebody, you know, out preaching and is killed for, for God's name. That's what was happening. They were persecuted for his namesake intensely. And the Bible says that we ought to mourn, but then be comforted. And so this is not just dealing with grief. This is not dealing with depression only. It's dealing with sin. It's dealing with sinful people that's hurting people. It's dealing with sinful world that we live in. And you know, folks, I believe we don't mourn enough over sin. I believe with all my heart, we're getting used to the darkness. I believe that we're trying to make excuses for a sinful nation. Uh, I was amazed at the, um, the elections yesterday that, uh, you know, a, a liberal got back in. And it seems like, well, they're not going to learn, you know, that, uh, you know, you go away from God, go away from God's plan, go away from uh, God's uh, the definition of marriage and definition of life. Uh, God ain't going to bless. He's going to curse uh, our nation. And they still elected a liberal. It's, 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 it's pathetic, you know, that people are so determined to have their way. And this world's in a mess. It's in a mess. The other day, um, Silas spilt something. We was keeping him. He spilt something. He looked down at the floor and he said a whole sentence. He says, you know, I made a mess. You know, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, this world's in a mess. I mean, it is in a, it is in a mess. This, this, there's a problem going on. And the problem is perverted values, sin, selfishness, vainglory, and leaving God out, kicking him out of the school, kicking him out of government, kicking him even out of the church. A lot of people are not even preaching the Bible these days. And so that's what was happening in these days. And he said, you better mourn about that. And if you really mourn, uh, God will give you, and this is it, supernatural sorrow. Supernatural sorrow and supernatural comfort. I want you to look at a great verse, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, I believe it is, in verse 10. Um, and um, it says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance. I'd like to preach just a few minutes on repentance. That brings comfort. Until you turn from your sin, you're never going to have comfort. You're never going to have happiness. You're never going to have joy. You're never going to have peace. Look at this verse now. It says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. The sorrow of the world worketh. Godly sorrow is a logical result of experiencing of the first beatitude. Poor in spirit, humble. It said, hey, God, I can't handle this. I can't handle the way the world is. I can't handle my friends being killed for Christ's sake, persecuted, put in jail. That's what they were living through. Godly sorrow affects the mind, the will, and the emotion. And it's very, very illustrated by the prodigal son. He just didn't say, I think I'll go home. He went home. He didn't say, I think I'll get out of this pig pen. He got out of the pig pen. He didn't say, hey, I think I've sinned against God and my father. He confessed it, and then he went to them and told them that he was sorry and that he was godly sorry. 
Folks, listen. If repent, if godly sorrow doesn't bring repentance, it's not the right kind of sorrow. Most people, I think with all my heart, uh, they do not truly repent. Let me just talk to you a little bit about true repentance. True repentance. Uh, we should repent of our sins. Amen. We ought to turn from them. And Psalms 38, verse 18. Psalms 38, verse 18 tonight. Y'all please pray for me uh, as I preach tonight. Sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's very difficult. That's all I'm going to say. Psalms 38, verse 18. The Bible says this. For I will declare my iniquity. I will be, I will be sorry for my sin. I'll be sorry for my sin. Now folks, be careful that it's a, a, a that it's sin that that you're sorry over, that you've offended the living God, that you've turned your back on God, that you've violated the scriptures and you've violated uh, what God has called you to be, and folks, not that you've been caught, not you're sorry for the painful consequences of sin, but you're sorry for sin, you're sorry for the very nature of. It. And you're not only sorry about your sin, you're sorry about the whole world's sin and our government's sin and our state's sin and, folks, uh, your best friend's sin. And you ought to be sorry um, for sin. Um, we ought to be sorry and have true repentance. Look at Acts chapter 20 and verse 21. Acts chapter 20 and verse 21. The Bible says this. It says... We ought to testify both the Jews, also the Greek, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to preach repentance, but we ought to demonstrate repentance. I want to tell you this. If you repent, you'll do the first work. I was dealing with a fellow uh, several years back, and he, ter he, he committed a terrible sin, terrible sin. And he said, I've repented. And, you know, I said, okay, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take your apology. I'll take... And you, you don't confess to me, you confess to God. I'll pray that you got right with God. But he never came back to church regularly. He never got involved. He never made it public to the church that he had sinned against the church and against God and, and a terrible sin. And I want to tell you something, there was no repentance. There was no repentance. When you repent, when you repent, you're so sorry for that sin, you make it right. Uh, it's like the uh, little boy said, I'm sorry for... for uh, for hitting all the little girls in class. And then the little girl um, piped up and says, and, you, and if you're really sorry, you'll stop doing it. And that's exactly what it is. If you're really repentant over your sins and really sorry for that sin, you won't do it again. And so a lot of people use God as a priest in the booth or some uh, uh, rabbit foot, some superstition. They can sin and confess, sin and confess, sin and confess, and marry as I live, and I don't have to really change my life. I don't even have to turn over, to turn away from that sin. I can just live like I want to as long as I say I'm sorry. Well, the trouble is, you're really not sorry. Because godly sorrow, sorrow leads to repentance. Can somebody say amen? amen? Christians should also repent. The Bible says over and over again that we ought to turn from our iniquities and turn from our backslidden. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 9, I believe it is. Uh, chapter 7, verse 9. Um, the Bible says this. It says, Now I rejoice not that we were made sorry, but the, that ye, so, ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly matter, that ye might receive damage, uh, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. And then it said, in godly sorrow work is repentance. You know what that's saying? It's saying, hey, listen, you, saw, you were so sorry you stopped doing it. You were so sorry you turned from your sin. And there's a lot of shallow confession going on and shallow repentance. And folks, I want to tell you something. When you get under a Holy Ghost godly sorrow, there's a mourning over sin. I mean, there's a mourn. Blessed are they that mourn. And I believe that the emphasis in context is mourn over sin. Mourn over sin. 
mourn over the, what's happening in this world and what's going on. We ought to mourn over our sin, but we ought to mourn over the, whole, the, the world's sin and, the, and the, our nation that was started to, to lift God and exalt God's sin. We ought to mourn. There ought to be a mourning. In the Bible days, they'd, they'd put ash cloth, ashes and sackcloth on. They'd demonstrate it publicly about how repulsive sin is. Today, it's sin confessed, live like you want to, and nothing's really wrong, and everything's relative, and there's no absolute wrong, no absolute right, and it's pathetic, and it's playing church. And blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. They shall be comforted. Christians should repent. Revelation chapter 2 talks about repentance. Verse 5, verse 16, chapter 3. Verse 3 and verse 19. Read it later. But folks, it says the church ought to repent. Ought to turn from your, from your iniquity. Turn from your, your sinfulness, your selfishness. And then we got to see surface dealing with sin cost King Saul his crown. Saul lied about his sin. Y'all know the story in 1 Samuel chapter 15. And um, we'll close with this illustration about two kings. Why did Saul not make it, commit suicide, went to a witch, and David became God's man after his own heart, wrote most, a lot of the Psalms? What was the difference? Godly sorrow. Mourning over sin. And turning from that sin, repentance, and being comforted. To be a comforter. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, King Saul... Uh, was was uh, commissioned to go and wipe out the Amalekites. Totally. Leave nothing behind. And in verse 13, uh, the Bible says, And Samuel uh, came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandments of the Lord. And then he heard some bleeding of the sheep, and said, Wait a minute, you're not supposed to be uh, recovering anything from these heathens. Uh, and he, he made an excuse instead of a confession. Look at verse 15. It says, And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. You know what he was saying? He was saying, Hey, listen, they did it. Isn't it easy to accuse somebody else? Isn't it easy to blame somebody else? That's what Adam did to Eve. The woman did it. And finally, he used religion to defend his, his works. He said, we're going to do it for a sacrifice. Saul said to Samuel in verse 20, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and I have bought Agag the king of Amalekites and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. No, he didn't. He kept some of them. But the people took of the spoil of the sheep and the oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice to the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And so we see finally he uses this great thing. We, 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 we've disobeyed to sacrifice. And the great verse is saying that obedience is better than sacrifice. You can't justify your sin. And then finally he said, I've sinned with conditions. In verse 30 he says, he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now. And so there was conditions to his confession. He says, I still want the honor. And so there ought to be some extremes to avoid. Number one, like King Saul, who was easy on sin. He says, you know, I, I meant good and I was going to sacrifice those sheep. And, and like David, he was too hard on himself. He wanted, to, he wanted to die instead of Absalom because of his sin. And so the key is confession. I want you to turn to 1 John 1, 9 and we'll close. 1 John 1, 9 is a great verse, but it's often misused. It's often misunderstood. There needs to be some mourning in this verse. We need to have a deep conviction about sin. We need to have sin is exceedingly sinful. Well, I don't tithe. Well, that's a sin. Well, I don't give. It's a sin. I don't have faith. That's a sin. I don't come to church. That's a sin. And folks, I want to tell you something. We just laugh it off, not laugh it off, we just shug it off and say, well, I'm better than the murderer next door. But folks, listen, we need to have a, 
extreme mourning over sin. We need to realize sin is exceedingly sinful and hurtful. If you only see the end of sin, like David saw four children die. But look at this. Uh, 1 John 1 9 it says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There it is. If we'll confess our sins. And so what does that say? A lot of people say, Well, that means I just say I'm sorry. But saying you're sorry is not enough. Confess means to say the same thing about it as God says it. It's judging and it's God's judging. It's seeing sin that, that that sin put Jesus on the cross. That's why he had to die for your sins. And folks, confess means say the same thing, but not just say it, mean it. Mourn over what we do and what we are. See, it's not just what we do, it's what we are. And I don't have time to go to Psalms 51, but if you'll read that sometime, it's one of the greatest confessions in the Bible. He said, I have sinned that my mother has conceived me in iniquity. That didn't mean he was an illegitimate child. It meant that he had a sinful nature. And so he was confessing even his sinful nature. And he was confessing that he was a sinner. And he was confessing what sin does to him and does to everyone else. And folks, what we need to have is a mournful spirit over sin. A mournful spirit over sin. Let me just hurry and say this. And I won't preach this, but I just want to uh, give it to you. Because I want to show you the way out. The promise of comfort. Far more than sympathy. Sympathy means to fill with. But comfort means to encourage and give strength. We have the comfort of God. We have the comfort of Scripture. We have the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And thank God we have the comfort of the local church. I want to tell you something. The church should be a comfort to you. Other people ought to be a comfort to you. Remember that funeral? When you just felt like you didn't have a friend and, and you didn't know what you was going to do, and everybody showed up with, with a meal, everybody showed up visitation, everybody was crying with you, they didn't know what to say, but they were there. Remember that? I want to tell you something. I don't know what people do without a church when they lose a loved one. I don't know what people do out of the will of God when there's a heartbreak. But folks, I want to tell you something. Also, there's comfort of the Holy Spirit when we confess and forsake our sin. When we say that, was, that is not just a little sin or a little white lie, I don't know where that word came from, but that, that's a lie against God. and That's a sin against God. That's against God's Word. And so God's Word comforts us with conviction. And then we have repentance, and then we can have comfort. And so blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. I don't believe it's just mourning over heartache, which that, it does mean that, but it means that you're comforted by the man of sorrow. The Lord mourned over sin of the world. Of course, it wasn't his sin and what sin was doing. And he faced the cross, uh, knowing eternal sorrowful sin uh, would be upon him. And he, he even sweat great drops of blood and and uh, he said, Father, if this cup can pass from me, because he knew how awful sin was going to be on him as he took your place. So here's the challenge. We need to realize that in life, there'll be a lot of times we'll have to mourn over our sin and mourn over other people's sin and mourn over sorrow. But there is a new comfort with every time of mourning. Because conviction leads to you knowing that God's the only one that can help you through this. He's the only one that can forgive you of your sins. He's the only one that can give you strength to not keep on sinning. He is the man of sorrow. And he took your place. Let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you, God, for the strength to be able to preach this tonight. Uh, Lord, I pray to your God that even though it was brief and shorter than usual, that, Lord, the Holy Spirit would use your, use your word to convict of the sinfulness of sin 
and the insufficiency of the of self and that thus lord we would just mourn have a deep conviction about that a deep repentance about sin a deep dependence upon uh, you during sorrow and that we would be comforted lord i'm comforted knowing there's a heaven praise god I know I'll see my loved ones again. What a comfort. Lord, thank you for heaven. Thank you for taking my hell. Thank you for paying the sin debt. And Lord, get taking my place and every person's in this room's place that they could have future comfort of heaven and being with their loved ones again and being, Lord, in a place of no more sin, no more Satan, and no more self. With every head bowed, every eye closed, just a moment of invitation. Have me say, Preacher, I'm glad I'm saved. And I'm glad that I realized I was a sinner. And, I, and I, I'm glad that I confessed that I was a sinner. And that I trusted the Lord as my Savior. And I know I can have His comfort. And He has comforted me many times because I've been saved. I know that I'm going to heaven. And I know that I have heavenly peace before I get there. Would you raise your hand as a happy testimony of that? You know you're saved know for sure. Isn't that a wonderful blessing? Say amen. Thank God. Several can all raise your hand. And you say, Preacher, do you mean if I'm not saved, I'm on my own? You mean to say if I'm religious, I'm on my own? Yes, you are. But you don't have to be on your own because Jesus came to this earth to love you and to help you and to help and convict you that you need Him. And when you trust Him, there is comfort because the comforter will come into your heart. You say, Preacher, I couldn't raise my hand, but I want you to pray for me because if I died today, I don't know I'd go to heaven. And if I live tomorrow, I don't know if I have heavenly peace and joy, but I sure am concerned about it. Would you please pray for me? You'll slip your hand up, then back down. Nobody's looking, nobody's talking, nobody's distracting. This is a holy time where you need to realize that you need to be saved. Anyone? Anyone? Just slip your hand up real high. Then back down. I'll pray for you. How many say, Preacher, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm saved. But I'm beginning to realize, and I, and I should re realize it every day, I just can't handle this sinful world anymore. I need God's comfort. I need God's conviction. And I need power to repent and not go along with the world. And I just need you to pray for me that I'd have Holy Ghost mourning that would turn into Holy Ghost comforting. And I need that in my life. And I want you to pray for it. Would you slip your hand up high for prayer all over this place? God bless you. Amen. I believe we need to pray for conviction. What a blessing. Conviction leads to repentance. And repentance leads to comfort. Amen. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you again for the help to be here and the strength to be here. Lord, I know the devil tried to hinder this. And I pray, dear God, that I didn't get in the way, that the message got across of how much we need you in these last days, in these sinful days, how much we need to realize how horrible and terrible sin really is, but how wonderful you, the Savior, can be to our lives. So, Lord, give us more faith. Give us more conviction. Give us a life that comforts others with the comfort that we receive. We'll praise you in Jesus' name.